Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Tennessee, and Virginia. Listen up. Win Bet is now live in all these states, and the excitement of Win Las Vegas has finally landed in online sports betting and casino play. From boosted parlays to live in game offs on every major sport, Win Bet gives you the tools to win. Sign up today for your risk free $1,000 sports bet. Download the Win Bet app now or visit wynnbet.com to start winning. You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. And we're good. So welcome in, everybody. It is the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Blue Wire Pods. And I'm your host, Chad Jensen, with me, my fellow football priest, the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kelberman. Zach, there's a lot to break down. We also have to start taking a look at the Washington football team. But first things first, dude. I mean, flurry of cuts, additions, signings, all that. We'll get to that. First things first, what was your take on the starting quarterback of these Denver Broncos saying publicly, it's not time to panic yet, but it almost is. What the Sam Hill could have possessed Teddy Bridgewater to even countenance such a notion? Well, first of all, Chad, if you're not ready to run through a wall after hearing that, something's wrong with you. I mean, what awe-inspiring, motivating message that is from Teddy Bridgewater. The season's not over yet, but almost. What she's pretty much saying here, they lose to Washington on Sunday at home. They lose five straight games. Vic Fangio might not even bother to show up on Monday. I mean, the locker room would be in full revolt mode. The players would be checking out. That's basically what the starting quarterback just admitted today publicly. I don't know if that's the message he intended to get across or um, he's just being honest and open and, and refreshingly transparent in an age where nothing is transparent but again if another player would have said that I mean quarterback or not I think he'd be getting a lot more scrutiny for some reason he has this veil uh, of immunity with whatever comments he makes however he plays he's never called out for it but to really say that that's how the the team is is approaching a must-win season saving uh, potential game coming up against the Washington football team coming off four straight losses, two straight ass kickings. Honestly, I mean, that's the only way to put that. And you're up there saying, well, it's not almost, uh, you know, done, but you know, it, we're getting there. It's not over yet. And then he goes, the locker room, uh, still has the faith. If you have to reassure that publicly, if you have to even say those words out loud, that means there is lost faith in the locker room. So it was a very questionable, um, press conference from Teddy Bridgewater and tying into that a questionable pressure from Fangio who kind of refuted Teddy's own words and him saying he was only 70 to 75 percent healthy against the Cleveland Browns last Thursday we'll get into that in a second but it doesn't seem like one hand knows what the other's doing in Dove Valley Chad it seems like Vic Fangio if it wasn't apparent already has lost control of the ship Listen up, Broncos country. Tick Pick should be your first choice to buy football tickets because they save fans money by never charging any service fees ever. Tick Pick is the exclusive ticketing partner for the Huddle Up podcast and the Blue Wire Network. Denver Broncos football is finally back, and there's no need to exhaust yourself searching all over the internet to find Broncos tickets anymore because Tick Pick, that's T I C K. P-I-C-K is the original no-fee ticket site and the only one you'll ever need as your go-to for all NFL tickets. TickPick got rid of all those awful service fees that the other ticket sites charge, which lets them guarantee the best prices on all of their NFL tickets. Don't believe it? If you can find better prices for the same seats on another ticket site, TickPick will give you 110% of the difference in the purchase price. That's right, guys. When we were searching for tickets for the MHH meet and greet for week three at home, Broncos versus Jets. Tick Pick had us locked down. So visit TickPick.com slash huddle today and use the promo code huddle to save $10 on your first order of Broncos tickets. <sighs> Confusion breeds chaos, right? And if it wasn't apparent and evident from the product on the field that we have witnessed, <clears throat> pardon me, over these last four games, I mean, I don't know what else you need to realize that this team is completely, I mean, is it a foot? 
is it horseback? Does it know up from down? I mean, they don't know what is going on. That's why someone needs to step in and honestly put this um, this animal out of its misery, so to speak. I'm an animal lover, so don't take that the wrong way. It's just a figure of speech, okay? Vic Fangio saying, Zach, that uh, after after Teddy did say that, hey, you know, I was probably like, you know, 70 75%. But, you know, once the adrenaline cooked, uh, kicked in, and of course I'm paraphrasing here, I was good to go. Fangio said, look, if he told me I could, he could play, I'm going to trust that he can play. And I thought he looked like he could play. Yeah. The first part of that game, Zach, didn't look so much like he could. Maybe he got himself a little toward all uh, shot during halftime or something. Maybe. Because he did look significantly better in the second half, but it still was just nothing to write home about. That's faux show. Uh, first of all, if I'm Drew Locke, I'm requesting a trade yesterday. The trade deadline's coming up next Tuesday, but that's another signal that he really has no future in Denver, and Vic Fangio and or Pat Shermer have a real axe to grind against number three. They would play a quarterback who's 70 to 75% healthy, who's been playing badly uh, during a losing streak, over a 100% healthy young quarterback who made it a neck-and-neck -neck competition in training camp for the starting job. So... Uh, Again, if, it, if that wasn't apparent before that, the Broncos, the 2021 Broncos, Fangio and company truly hate Drew Locke on a personal level. Uh, it's obvious now. And again, about player safety, Chad, I think John Harbaugh right now somewhere in Baltimore is laughing. Vic Fangio calls him out after a brutal uh, curb stomping, but he's playing a starting quarterback, coming off a concussion, and then dealing with two lower leg injuries, 70 to 75% healthy on a short week. I mean, that's hypocritical, it's incompetent, and it's fireable, to be honest. I, I mean, look, <clears throat> I'm not Freud over here, all right? But it feels like to me that Fangio, just from his pressers this week, is shook. All right, he's uh, the cracks are starting to come through uh, the veneer. You can see it. You can hear it. It is palpable. This is right after, <clears throat> pardon me, um, Teddy had said, yeah, 70, 75%. Here's his actual direct quote, Zach. Fangio, I think he was a little higher than that, but I'm not doubting his word. <laughs> How are you going to tell him? <laughs> right. I thought he looked fine out there. I didn't think he was 100%. He's our quarterback. When your quarterback can go, you go with him unless he can't go. He never said he couldn't go, and I'm confident in taking his word on that. So, Zach, you know, part of this is if Teddy Bridgewater knows how it works in the league, and oftentimes you give a backup just a sliver, right, just a window, you don't know if you're ever going to get that job back. And so, I mean, Peyton Manning, for example, who never, ever had to ever worry about losing a job to a backup, was notorious for, A, never relinquishing first-team reps in practice and training camp unless he was getting, like, a veteran rest day or something. And, B, I mean, the dude played through a lot of injuries, hence the requirement for the four neck surgeries that ended up, you know, costing him his uh, 2011 season and landed him in Denver. Johnny says, if we're a top-10 pick this year, uh, do you think we trade up and reach for a quarterback? Doesn't seem like too good of a QB class. I mean, look, I listen to the draft experts. I listen to guys like Nick Kendall and Eric Trickle and even Scott Kennedy. Um, they don't love the 2022 class. And there's an article that we can go through later on tonight, break down the six names on it, um, that Eric Trickle said, look, here's the six guys that are going to factor in to the first round conversation come 2022. So six top options for the Broncos. But here's a uh, – Spoiler, all right? He doesn't think any of the six are worthy of a top 20 pick. Now, Zach, that doesn't mean they won't ultimately end up getting picked somewhere in the top 20. But as that chat or that comment said, it probably will require a reach of some sort. It's either that or one of these guys ends up with what the balance of the college football season is, plus the senior bowl, plus, you know, the combine, things like that. One of these guys are some of these guys end up really rocketing their, their draft stock uh, from where they are today. 
Well, if I could address the previous point about Teddy and Vic, how are you going to tell Teddy how healthy he is? And it just seems like even challenging that is taking responsibility, uh, Fangio taking it off his own plate. And then him saying that, oh, the quarterback told me he was healthy, so I'm going to just trust him and I'm going to play him. You're the head coach of the football team. You make the final call. So once again, it's him going like, it's not me, not me doing it. Teddy did it. Teddy felt he could play, and he told me, and I went with that. He is not cut out to be a head coach, and he proves it more and more and more, but the fact that he's saying these things out loud now shows that he's completely tone deaf, and you can question whether he knows the writings on the wall. In terms of a quarterback, it's really only two choices. The, f- the free agent signing market isn't anything to write home about, as, as far as I know. So it's going to be a trade for a veteran, not Deshaun Watson, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure, not Aaron Rodgers, I'm pretty sure, maybe Russell Wilson. I mean, if he wants out of Seattle again, I think, though, knowing George Payton, he'll go the right and correct route, which is a young quarterback in the draft, he who shall remain undetermined until we get closer to the draft. But I think that's the way the Broncos are going to go. Guys, I'm going to teach you a little something-something for those. And, yes, Cody, uh, Vic does very much seem like he is deflecting, uh, avoiding anything he can to uh, basically not stand up and take responsibility here. There's a little something called if for leadership, for business – uh, it's called the Peter Principle, all right? This was something that was taught to me by my father, all right? Shout out Mark Jensen. If you know him, you know him. But what is the Peter Principle? I'm going to go ahead and quote, <clears throat> since I'll probably botch it. I'm gonna just going to read real quick, Zach, because Vic Fangio exemplifies this. What is the Peter Principle? It is a concept in management developed by Lawrence J. Peter, which observes that people in a hierarchy tend to rise to a level of respective incompetence. In other words, employees are promoted based on their success in previous jobs until they reach a level at which they are no longer competent, as skills in one job do not necessarily translate to the other. The Peter Principle, you are you are always going to be promoted to the level of your own incompetence. And from there, you typically you rise no more. You sink back down. Vic Fangio exemplifies the Peter principle and Claude jumping in to say the coaching staff is lame. Hard to watch them squander the youth and talent of these athletes. It will get better, but when? Also, I'm over Teddy. He is what we always knew he was. Nice guy, mediocre QB, go Broncos. Apparently not very good at giving rousing uh, motivational speeches either. I mean, the guy who doesn't check social media, Chad, the guy who doesn't, you know, really keep in tune with anything going on in the Lord's year 2021, I'm not surprised by that. He was always a passive, docile guy. He was also always a journeyman quarterback who might start out hot and beat up on bad teams, as he did. But as Chad and I warned you, and a, a very small sec did as well, uh, he tends to regress back to the mean. And the mean for him is average to below average play, journeyman holdover band-aid play. And that's what we've gotten and worse with Teddy the last few games. And that's what he'll always be, sadly. Great guy, but number two quarterback. How much more do you really need to see? That's the question. Like, again, what's what's motivating this? Is it pride? Is it hold on for dear life, never say never? I mean, because that's the John Elway mindset is, never say die. Like I, I don't quit until I no longer have the option. Like you have to remove the option from me uh, before I'm going to quit competing for that objective. And I can, you have to respect that to a point, but for these Denver Broncos, it's not like you have, you know, Jeff Driscoll, Zach sitting on the sideline. It's Drew Locke. And I get it. There's people right now that heard me say that, that roll their eyes and go, what are you talking about? Like Drew Locke's any better than Jeff Driscoll. Give me a break, dude. And here's the thing. We keep talking about this. It's not as if Drew Locke, after a lackluster year or two, didn't show his coaches. And they told him, you got to get better, dude. That wasn't good enough. And so he went out and he did get better. He sought out additional help, coaching, tutelage, Peyton Manning, you name it. And he, and he got better. I want to see that, Zach, and then we'll grab Josh. But is it fair to say, though, that he got better despite the, the hamperment of uh, Pat Shermer? I mean, now, Pat, with two different starting quarterbacks in Denver two separate years, he's showing to be the same awful play caller who lives in the past. So I, I think it's a credit to Teddy for what he did early on at 3-0, and and also Drew for the leap that he took because he made that leap despite being held back by someone like Pat Shermer. I mean, I, I think more people are awake to that um, issue now in Denver. Josh Hoyle, hey, man. 
really appreciate everything you've done for Mile High Huddle. Uh, recently in particular, you've really come on strong. It's been great getting to know you a little bit in the chat. And thank you for the support. He says, why don't we have anyone calling Teddy out for these comments? He's a team captain. Watching him play, he looks like he doesn't care and has no fire in him. Drew should have been named the starter by name or come in in the last game. Before we completely crucify Teddy Bridgewater, Zach, let me actually read the full quote, okay? The full uh, transcript of what he said. Um, let me just find it real quick. All right, here, here's what he said. Do you believe, Teddy, that the locker room is still connected? And how do you balance a sense of urgency without pressing, right? That word that media likes to use a lot, pressing. Quote, here's Teddy. It's definitely a locker room that's still together. You can sense there's no panic. I said this to the guys yesterday. I'm like, man, we've got to have a sense of urgency. It's not time to panic, but it almost is because this thing can go in the wrong direction fast. I think we have that sense of urgency, and we have to go out there with the right mindset. It starts, and then he goes on to think about practice and all that. But in defense of Teddy Bridgewater, all right, I think in his mind, I, I, I don't want to speak for him. I can't speak for him, but this is me interpreting his intention. And I get it, Zach, road to hell paved with good intentions, right? But in his mind, he's trying to convey to the, to the media, hey, look, I've been trying to tell my guys, don't panic. It's not time to panic yet. But it could be soon if you don't turn the ship around. Like, we have to come together now or else it's going to be time to hit. So, like, you know, it can be it can be in a very forgiving way, Zach. You can give him the benefit of the doubt. But it's still very poor choice of words at the podium amidst a four-game losing streak. I'm going to just assume that Teddy had good intentions and it was worded incorrectly. And, you know, we know all about that, chat. Sometimes we make a, try to make a point on here and it doesn't come out the right way and you, and you watch it back and you kind of cringe. But first he said, no panic at all. And then he said, we have to have urgency or else we'll need to panic. And then he goes, it's almost time to panic. So re really, which one is it at? I mean, I think it's a lie, an outright lie to say there's no panic in the three and four Broncos locker room. Lo losers of four straight games and all four pretty bad losses. I think it's closer to honesty for him to say it's the season's on the brink here, guys. It's almost time to hit the panic button. It's almost time to question whether the locker room is going to remain cohesive and together. Um, again, I think he had the right intentions, but I think the first part of that statement was an outright falsehood. Zach, back to some content here. Let's grab Travis's message first, though. He says, uh, evening priests in Broncos country. I'm just ready for our Broncos to turn things around, hoping next year we get a young quarterback and start over. On that topic, Zach, you and I have kind of counseled everybody to kind of have patience and not jump the gun on completely dismissing 2022's NFL draft class uh, as far as quarterbacks. Um how are you feeling about that? And I can pull up Eric's article here. In fact, I'm going to while you remark here. About next year's draft class? Yeah, I, I mean, I, they're not as as, as uh, lauded, you know, or praised as the 2021, this year's class was. But, uh, you know, like Chad and I have been saying, there's always going to be some guy who's going to pop later on in the pre-draft process, whether it's the combine or a pre-draft workout or Later in the college football season, there are options out there, but a lot will depend on who's going to be molding this quarterback, who's going to be developing this quarterback, who's going to be at the controls of the Broncos. If Vic Fangio and Pat Shermer obviously doesn't inspire much confidence, even though we think they're going to be gone, but someone like Helen Moore, Brian Dayball, Greg Roman, one of those three would. Um, I, I like Malik Willis's talents. I like Matt Corral. I be, those are, my, I think, my top two guys in this class. But as uh, I think it's Eric with the article here, he yep. lays out you know in detail um, the finer points of, of the upcoming class. By the way, guys, Scott did the math. So we're at 13% to get the goal on Facebook with 16% left in the month. So just a little bit of a gap we got to make up. Just a hair. We've already overcome a huge deficit. So props to you guys, but a little bit more to push. Swag Nation, what's good, buddy? Appreciate you being with us. Thank you for the super. He says, I don't care how many defensive people they sign, the Broncos, unless they can coach or throw the ball, we will lose until Bridgewater is benched and Vic is fired. That could be true. That could be true. And you know what? I'm going to come back to the whole quarterbacks thing here in a second. Um, the Broncos sign or tra acquired, pardon me, Stephen Weatherly over the weekend, edge rusher. They acquired Kenny Young, linebacker from the Rams, who I don't think he's too stoked to be in Denver, to be honest with you, after some things I've heard today. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and then yesterday, Zach, well, let's just count Monday as well. Between Monday and Tuesday, George Payton cut six people, six players. Now, half of them were from the practice squad, but it was, I don't know. I couldn't help it. Uh, I can go through it for those of you who might have missed the names, but I couldn't help but feel like Peyton was sending a message of sorts. And even, I get it, none of these were like huge headliner names, okay? These weren't like stud contributors. These were bubble-type guys. But nevertheless, I can't help but think, Zach, that he was sending a message. Well, I mean, I I, I kind of caught some flack on Twitter. I, you know, I, I praised George Peyton the day before he made these moves by saying, you know, when you sign Avery Williamson off the street, when you sign John Brown off the street, when you acquire a young starting inside linebacker for a 2024 sixth-round draft pick, George Payton's not the problem in Denver. And everyone was saying, well, what did Williamson do? He's no longer around. And people try to, you know, freezing cold take me and say, well, John Brown's gone, so how'd that work out? They were still signed. That fact doesn't change. It's George Payton's job to buy the groceries. It's not his job to cook the meal. So it's not Peyton's fault that Pat Shermer made no do with David Moore, John Brown, and K.J. Hamler before that. It's not his fault that Vic Fangio made no do with Avery Williamson. So I, I, it was sending a message, but you have to also make roster room for the players you need right now. Obviously, Albert O is a young piece coming back. They had to get Jerry Judy. They needed a linebacker like Jonas Griffith. Um, but it, it's not only so much George Peyton can do, and I don't think he's responsible at all for what's going on in Denver, kind of as a quick aside. Here is the listed name. So first of all, it started on Monday because they had to make room for the acquisition of Weatherly, and so they cut Curtis Robinson, all right? Then on Tuesday, the Broncos waived from the active roster Damaria Crockett. Is that how you say it? I, I always Demaria. I Demaria, think. thank you, man. Uh, Demaria, I got to remember Demarius, and that'll get it right. Demaria Crockett, um, running back, linebacker, um, Curtis Robinson, I mentioned. Uh, Natani Muti was was put on the CV reserve list, so sounds like he's either uh, been exposed to the bug or might have tested positive for the bug, so he'll be back. Um, and then from the practice squad, the Broncos released John Brown, uh, guard center Javon Patterson, cornerback Savion Smith. As well, good news, as Zach mentioned, the Broncos opened the 21-day practice window for inside linebacker Jonas Griffith. Now, he's a guy that was kind of new to the team, uh, over the summer, they acquired him. I can't remember if he was a waiver claim or a trade. I'm trying to remember. Either way, he's got some upside as a linebacker, but he got hurt early in the season. He's coming back. He's going to be able to provide some depth. Relatively untested, though. And then Albert O coming back from that hammy. So that's what you had yesterday, Zach. And then today, more cuts from the practice squad, which we can go over. What a lot of people forget, too, uh, or don't know, is that John Brown requested his release from the Broncos practice squad. Someone said in the comments, uh, Brown would rather be unemployed than play in Denver. Avery Williamson did the same thing. He asked for his release, and he went back to Tennessee. So that says to me uh, he wasn't getting playing time from the coaches. They had no idea how to utilize those players. So for anyone bagging on George Payton, I think, Chad, maybe you disagree, but he's done a bang-up job in year one acquiring the talent, uh, restocking the cupboard. It's not his fault that the coaching staff let him down. I honestly don't have much to criticize George Payton over at this stage just because this is a guy that's trying to manage a team with one arm tied behind his back, basically, right? He had right. a lame duck head coach who led his team to sub 500 seasons in each of his first two years, foisted on him. And then in that situation, it's like, Hey, do the best you can try and make some lemonade here and hope for the best hope that this is one of those, you know, miraculous Hollywood turnaround. Uh, remember the Titans situations where, you know, they a, a coach revives his career, on the brink of ruin, but it just didn't shake out that way. Vic Fangio went 0-2, or pardon me, went uh, sub-500 in his first two years for a reason. There's some there there, and the Broncos, you know, are paying the price for it. And what I think, if I could criticize George Payton for anything, it's at what point, how much longer are you going to allow Vic Fangio to make these tone-deaf, right. completely ridiculous uh, decisions in terms of who's playing, who's not in the face of mounting, stacking consecutive losses. Like when are you going to step in and say, look, Teddy, sit down. We got, let's go see what drew. What, we can't get any worse. Like we need some kind of a spark. And we've got this young kid who we've developed, 
who we've paid the price for, who we went through the trial and error learning curve and all that stuff, showed us some signs. When, George, are you going to step in? And Shane here says, hey, guys, do you think when Peyton hires a new coach, he'll hire a coach that runs the zone blocking schemes like they do in Minnesota? I think pretty good, pretty safe bet that that will be probably would be my guess. And the thing about uh, the Broncos and George Payton stepping in, it, it's one thing for Fangio to have the run of the asylum, so to speak. But now that your starting quarterback is up there on the podium and saying the season's on the brink, the season's almost over, the locker room is kind of being held together with duct tape and gum right now, uh, that puts pressure on George Payton. He doesn't want to come off submissive or passive or beta in any way. He can't be subservient to his head coach and his quarterback, the quarterback that he traded for and the quarterback that's letting the team down. Down and contributing, not to soul factor, but contributing to the Broncos losing streaks. That's why I'm saying if they lose to Washington, Peyton should and will step in. Uh, K Shoguki, K Shoguki TV. <clears throat> hey, welcome. Thank you for that super chat. He wants the Broncos to hire Kellen Moore. Me too. And operate a 4 3 defense. Why the 4 3? I'm curious. You think that's what the personnel they have now would be best suited toward. I, I'd be curious to let us know, but yeah, he's up there. That's Zach's number one. For me, it's the number two. Uh, Naj Altaf, what's good, dude? Naj, if you ever need a shot of life, if you ever get out of bed in the morning and you're just kind of slow and you got a little uh, sleep inertia, as they call it, just text Naj and have him give you a call real quick and you will wake right up. All right. You'll be chipper. You'll be happy-go-lucky, ready to attack the day. He says, I believe Teddy has been one of the players who has consistently played hard. He's made bad plays, yes, but he played on one leg in Cleveland. That's on Fangio, not liking or trusting Locke. No more talk, just play to potential. Yeah, and here's the thing. I would agree with that. I don't think, as far as, like, Teddy, how hard has he played? Like, how much, you know, has he given in this effort? And like we said, Zach, when we were at the um, meet and greet game, all right, week three, Jets, Broncos rolled over them pretty handily. And I spent a lot of time kicking it there next to uh, Kayaka and some, oh, uh, what's his, what are their names? I'm so sorry. I'm forgetting your names that uh, were also next to us. Either way, great members of our community. I'll get the name. Hold on. I'm not going to leave you hanging like that. But um, I kept a Isaac on Teddy in between series, like body language, what he was doing as he came off the field, things like that. And, you know, in that moment, the dude was clearly the the rooster in charge. Like he was the guy running ish. Okay. Like he was the guy everyone was looking to. Uh, it's like that old saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, if Teddy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, that type of thing. And I don't doubt that he's given his all. Naj, I think he has. It's just that his all ain't good enough. That's a problem. Exactly. Yeah, you know, it, he's a, he. I was doing the same thing at the Jets game. I was watching him closely when Melvin Gordon scored. He went over there, and it was very business like. But you can tell that he was the leader, and he was proud, and Melvin Gordon was making him proud, Chad. Um, but I also noticed, obviously, his play wasn't good enough. That was the game where he got KJ Hamler, you know, out for the season with a hospital ball that he threw too high. So his play, that's exactly what it is. It hasn't been good enough. It's been below average. It's been what he's been replacement level his entire NFL career. I don't fault this season solely on Teddy Bridgewater. Like I didn't fault last year solely on Drew Locke. The coaching is a much bigger problem, though Teddy's physical limitations don't do him any uh, good either. But for him to play through that game, I gave him credit, Chad, in the Gut Reaction podcast. Obviously hobbled. He was making chicken salad out of chicken you-know-what getting out of sacks, you know, climbing up in the pocket. He's been doing that the entire season. He's been saving the Broncos' OL's bacon a lot. But his arm and his now his decision-making, all these five interceptions in three games, holding the ball at the third longest clip in the NFL, that's bad play. That's replacement-level play. So it's, it's, you have to separate the two. Those great, great members of our community, Tony Bernard, his wife, Marissa. Shout-out to you guys. Love you, appreciate you. You're awesome. It was cool getting to watch that game with you uh, and appreciate. He actually, they bequeathed those tickets to myself and I gave one to Kayaka and we all hung out together, the four of us watching the game. So shout out to the Bernards. Here's Christian. What's good, bro? How are you? Are you doing good? Keep your chin up. This too shall pass. Malik Willis, Matt Corral, Carson Strong, Sam Howell, Kenny Pickett, Desmond Ritter. There is very many quality options in my opinion. People are overreacting about this class and still will have six 
first round quarterbacks. Well, those are the names. Let's get to it real quick, Zach. Um, Christian kind of bumped us along on this, but here are the names uh, that Eric Trickle isolated in this article. Carson Strong from Nevada. Let me just read a snippet. Okay. Strong is the top quarterback in the class for most draft analysts. He has a strong arm that can make all the NFL throws and is a good processor. Uh, Another uh, notable aspect with Strong is how trusted he is by his coaches to make calls at the line of scrimmage, which is not typical for college quarterbacks. And then he goes on to talk about his uh, the concern with his kind of lack of mobility. The league is trending towards mobile quarterbacks, and he's one of the pocket statues of old. Then you get Malik Willis, who's the exact opposite of that, out of liberty. All right. Uh, Quote, this is Eric. There was a lot of hype around Willis entering the season because he is an exciting player. He's probably the best athlete at the position in this draft class, has a good arm for the league. In addition, he is a dual-threat quarterback who's dangerous when he starts moving around. However, he has not made the progress many were hoping to see this year when working as a passer, and that's even more concerning when looking at the teams he has faced, which should be opponents he should look great against. The season didn't start badly for him, but having back-to-back games with six total picks – has put a sour note on his draft stock. And then you get Matt Corral here. This this dude kind of interests me, Zach. I'm not going to lie. Uh, he says, Corral's another favorite of many draft analysts because he has all the tools to be an NFL Q. His arm is NFL caliber, and he is more than good enough as an athlete and a runner to thrive at the next level. He also does a good job, for the most part, of protecting the ball, despite two games in 2020 where he threw 11 of his 14 picks on the season. Then you got Desmond Ritter, all right, from Cincinnati. Did I skip one? Nope, Desmond Ritter from Cincy, all right, another interesting guy. Um, Athleticism, mobility, does a good job keeping his eyes downfield, all right. Ball placement, he's kind of hot and cold. Sometimes he throws balls that you're like, dang, that was accurate. How do you do that? And then the next time you're like, dude, that was a Tim Tebow donker. What's going on here? Uh, Kenny Pickett from Pittsburgh (laughs) is another name. Awful last name for a quarterback. (laughs) True, true. Last thing I'm going to read to quote Eric here, the big riser in this class so far is Pickett, uh, or is it Pickett? Either way, who was viewed as a later day three pick, but is now getting talked about as an early day two option. He has shown decent improvements in a few key areas, primarily decision-making and being more calculated with the risks he takes. There's also, uh, there also is more trust in his arm, which was a problem in previous years, which has opened things up for the Pittsburgh offense. And then, um, questions about how he plays under pressure, things like that. So that's kind of the snapshot, Zach, of the six guys that are vying for first round consideration. And then we'll grab Devin. I mean, all of them are going to require good to elite coaching to, to hit their respective ceilings. Uh, Malik Willis intrigues me. I, I think he's the dual threat guy, you know, who he's going to get the most, I think pre-draft hype. Matt Corral kind of reminds me of Chad Kelly, maybe a little higher floor than Chad Kelly, but he's the safer pick of the bunch, I believe. So I would be happy with Willis Ritter only if they get like a Kellen Moore or Greg Roman. They're never going to win with a Ritter if they pair him with a defensive mind like a Dan Quinn or Jonathan Gannon. So for my money right now, I know it's early to 27th of October. A lot can and will change before April, but Malik Willis or Matt Corral for me, one and two. I forgot. He also has Sam Howell listed the last one. And Sam Howell was viewed as like bona fide first rounder, but after losing a bunch of his weapons at NC, including, of course, Pookie, uh, he has struggled to uh, be that tide that raises all ships. Devin Taylor, what's good, buddy? He says, we can all see the problems on the field. Has there been any movement on the ownership front? No. Not to my knowledge. No development there, Zach. Yeah, let's just hope Joe Ellis's emails don't leak between now and next year. You never know what you're going to find, right? Howie freaking day. Got the new Vaughn jersey. All right, finally, dude, finally. Um, he says, looks dope. Thanks, Mile High Huddle. Y'all be killing it. All right, dude, send us a pic, right? Either DM us on Facebook, DM the Mile High Huddle Facebook page, or shoot us an email, milehighhuddle at Gmail. Let's see that bad boy, all right? Because you got the salute to service one is what you pick, right? So let's see how that bad boy looks. Congrats. Well, you know, Chad, about the ownership thing, it came out yeah. a few days ago. We didn't touch on it that Bezos reportedly, according to Peter King, is not interested in buying the Broncos. So for now, right. we can rule him out, which is probably a good thing. But it's not. <clears throat> it's good uh, context. I guess that's a better answer than what I gave him. Uh, but there's no new development on, is the team getting sold? Is there going to be a bowl in that right. ends up you know, winning this Game of Thrones? We'll see. Uh, Michaela, the Duchess, 
when she weighs in, it is always from the top rope. Thank Macho you, Man Randy Savage. Boom. That's she. She makes an impact. Thank this you. is how she rolls. It was no different at the meet and greet. When she came in, it was like a bomb of excitement exploded. Poof. Oh, Michaela's here. Everyone wanted to talk to Michaela. Everyone wanted to get pictures with Michaela. She was the superstar. She is a superstar. She's saying we need a teacher as a coach, in my opinion. Keep on getting busts after a while. You must blame the coaches. No. Yeah, I mean, there's so many. You look at the attributes that you that you need and want, ideally, for a successful NFL coach, and that's certainly one of them in terms of being able to be a good teacher and be a good coach. But I think for the Broncos, they need vision, and they need offensive vision, which, you know, that's not Vic Fangio's forte, Zach, and the guy he decided to surround himself with um, – woefully lacking such things give zach taylor this roster they're not three and four hell give rich basaccia this roster they're not three and four so yeah it's all about having good coaching <laughs> oh, and that and still having, stings dude it's true though i mean he got him up on a short week in in the face of a scandal and whooped a rival's ass and you know uh handily so I give Bisaccia all the credit. If the Broncos had a coach that would inspire the players like that, with the level of talent they have on the roster, injured or not, they would not have the same record. Believe me. Most definitely. Most definitely. By the way, while we're on the topic of Super Chat Superstars, we are also raffling off a Passer Tan jersey to the top five finishers on Super Chat in the month of October. And then we're also going to raffle off some MHH swag to each of the tiers Okay, that we'll go through here. But the top five right now are Mark from Georgia, Mark Langley, who has just been unbelievably generous to the show uh, this month. We love Mark. In fact, I was talking to Mark on the phone right before we went live. The Duchess at number two. We'll see how tonight, how that alters her ranking, but she's going to be, I mean, with three, four days left to go, she's going to be in the raffle. Naj has climbed into, uh, well, he's been in the top five, but he's now at number three. The Queen, Christy, at number four. And Seth Harmon, is at number five and then studs like Chris and Chris actually sent me a, an interesting email, Zach, if we get time tonight, uh, he forwarded something to me on the topic of leadership relative to what Fangio is not bringing to the table. That is definitely worth the topic. If we get time, Dale seven, uh, Brian Greenfield, eight, nine, uh, Aaron Lynch, 10, uh, Shane Daniels. So each of these tiers guys, everyone's going to be in the running for a little something trust when we do the, um, drawing, in the beginning of November. Te- uh, Shane says, Teddy holding on to the ball is what is causing a lot of the sack and QB hits and watching tape. He isn't anticipating receivers getting open or he's way under throwing them. Yeah, Teddy, look, there's a difference between effort, all right, and then and execution. And Teddy, man, like, uh, who was it? I think Dave Bingaman, one of our great listeners, community members, sent me a, an email um, that had Kurt Warner's breakdown on Teddy in Cleveland. Yeesh. Well, that's all I can say. Wince, right? Uh, it's just the dude is not seeing the field, and he's supposed to be the guy that you don't have to worry about seeing the fields at. Well, I'll give you credit, Chad, because you said he hasn't been the same since the concussion, and I think you're onto something with that. Also, you have to wonder if Teddy is now you know, getting happy feet because of the OL keep breaking down every single week is he seeing ghosts a la Sam Darnold in the pocket and bailing before he has to so I think that's what's causing a dip in his play also after the Broncos 3-0 start when Pat Shermer pulled out of his bag the tiny bit that he can pull NFL teams adjusted the the quality of competition got better and the secret was quickly out on the Broncos offense and teams are now playing the Broncos differently and when you pair that with, again, the coaching and the play calling, it's just all downhill for a mediocre talent. Great guy, mediocre talent like Teddy Bridgewater. Yep, and that's one of the things that we said in the offseason run-up to you know the big 50-50 competition was, man, if Teddy's talent was commensurate with his kind of leadership moxie and his reputation as a stand-up guy, you'd have a, hall, you'd have a future Hall of Famer. You know, it's just... Unfortunately, it's not the way the cookie has crumbled. All right. Um, Swag Nation jumping in again to say, believe it or not, Peyton does like Drew Locke. Hold on. Let me start that over. Believe it or not, Peyton likes Drew uh, likes Locke. Drew Locke will be the starting quarterback next year, and Peyton will put a better coaching staff around him to succeed. Zach, your thoughts? Takes two to tango. I mean, I, I don't think Locke is – 
invested anymore with the Broncos, nor really should he be. I, I mean, he gave it all he could this offseason to get better, and he did get better, and he, in a lot of ways, beat out Teddy over the summer and showed a lot of things he, he could do that Teddy can't, and he still didn't get it, and they just refused to play him at all costs. So I think Te uh, Drew sees the writing on the wall. He's a young quarterback. He probably wants to be with a contending team, at least with better coaching. So I'm, I'm furthest of that opinion. I'm a, still a big Locke fan, but I think he is not the Broncos starting quarterback now or of the future. They made that yeah. decision this, the day they named Teddy the starter. That's why it was such a face palmer because in so doing, you – and I know you can always go back on it, but if you're willing to, to move on from him now, then you're willing to move on. That means you're at that point where he's no longer the factor into the future. You know, he's just not that guy. So as much as I want to share in your um, optimism that George Payton still has a plan for Drew in 21 and beyond, I just don't see it, buddy. I don't. Because if he really felt that way, he would have strong-armed Vic into, no, you can always go to Teddy. We're going to give it one last whirl with Drew. See what we got. Make sure we know what we have. Even if you felt like, we reached our ceiling with Drew. It was such an outlier year, 2020, with all the weird pandemic, you know, issues, obstacles, things that popped up that, you know, hey, even if we felt like we hit our ceiling with Drew, we want to be sure in a more traditional formatted season, you could have always gone to Teddy. They didn't for a reason. And that's because I, I don't think George Payton really cares all that much, to be frank. Like, he was a holdover quarterback that he inherited. And even though he right. has said things, Zach, like, yeah, he's a guy that, you know, has all the tools. You look for guys like that. You know, you, he probably believes that, but there's a difference between a guy, a, a GM saying he's a guy that has all the tools and a, a GM that speaks through his actions, which is, yeah, he's a guy that has, I say in the off season, there's a guy that has all the tools. And then guess what? My guy that I said has all the tools. He's starting week one. You know, that's, I mean, if those things aren't unified, then, you know, put on your glasses or, you know, get your crystal ball and try and interpret and read between the lines. Yeah, I wanted to say earlier that Peyton came in having no investment to Drew Locke. He didn't draft him. I mean, he didn't he didn't invest that capital in a quarterback like Drew Locke. That was an Elway pick. And what the Broncos have done to Drew Locke is they David card him, not physically by battering him, but emotionally, psychologically, mentally, they broke Drew Locke and it's up to the next coaching staff on his next team to fix that or salvage that if they even can all right here is one from um Doug Raquel what's up bro appreciate you he said why did we get rid of the speedy wide receiver that we just acquired three words coaching 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 he also as Zach mentioned you know word on the street is he wanted out like he requested I this sucks I mean he got one because... target in two games, right? If I'm not mistaken, one target. And it was a woefully red play by Teddy and a woefully underthrown ball that was picked off in the end zone. So he's like, which way is the wind blowing? I can see that this is a ship going down. Get me out of here. You know, cut me, please. And they well, obliged. For those who think it's a John Brown problem, David Moore got two targets, a whopping two targets, Chad, before he was cut. And how, how often were the Broncos using, using K.J. Hamler to his abilities as a deep threat? It's just Pat Shermer is adverse to throwing the ball down the field and coming into this decade as a play caller. You know, Scott brings up a good point on the whole Drew Locke thing and all the players or players who you might feel like aren't getting their uh, due under this coaching staff is, you know, a coaching change it's a clean slate for everybody. And that's why when the Broncos foisted Vic Fangio upon a new GM, like traditionally, I mean, I don't 90 times out of a hundred, something like that. It's a clean slate from executive to coach because you're given the entire team from a vision and unity perspective, that full clean slate. You got the clean slate with George, but you didn't with the coach. And so you're seeing the same old issues and the same old peccadillos rearing their ugly heads. Well, technically that's true, yeah, but so the Broncos are going to do, they foisted Vic Fangio on George Payton, and they're going to foist Drew Locke on the next head coach. The next head coach is going to want his own quarterback, especially if that next head coach is a Kellen Moore or, you know, Greg Roman, Brian Dayball. Drew Locke is done in Denver. I'm sorry, I'll put money on that. He's, he's sucks, played his last snap. True. Um, Matthew, he says, and thank you for all your support, bro. He says, what do you think of Lincoln Riley? 
paired with Ritter. Zach, no. is there any reasonable expectation that the Broncos, A, first of all, that Lincoln Riley, A, would want to come to the NFL and if in so doing, go to the Broncos, B, that George Payton would be interested in bringing Lincoln Riley to Denver? How, how the Jaguar is dealing with Urban Meyer, because that's what I feel like Lincoln Riley would be in the NFL. Some coaches are just cut out to be at the college level, and I think Lincoln Riley is is one of them. Maybe as an OC, I can see him getting some play because that's his uh, you know level of expertise, that side of the ball. As a head coach, no. Give me someone that has their bona fides in the NFL, preferably a younger guy. I mean, there's so many candidates out there, Chad. We named a few, but there's realistically five or six that are going to be in the hiring cycle. And the Broncos, if they're smart, they would emerge with one of them. Let's grab Andrew, and then Jeff has been waiting patiently on a Super. I'll grab him next, too. Andrew Baker, what's good, bro? I hope you're doing well. He says, stepping in late again, been busy. But, hey, we might have a chance to beat the Chiefs, which I know we all want, regardless of a playoff chance. Yes, indeed, brother. But, you know, don't count those chickens before they've hatched. Did Chad? Did you see or anyone see the the video? <laughs> it was of uh, Pat Mahomes and his uh, wife Brittany and his brother Jackson. They were making a TikTok video, and Jackson and Brittany are dancing and kind of acting obnoxious. And Pat Mahomes is sitting there, face down, not making a movement, not making you know he was silent completely, like he hated his life. I uh, mean, that man is struggling right now, and he's either going to rebound from that or he's going to just you know fall into deeper into the sunken place. Here's the thing to keep in mind with college coaches and translating to the league. All right, you're, you're seeing it now with Urban Meyer. You saw it with Chip Kelly, who come from schools that were juggernaut recruiters that all the kids wanted to play for. It's it's tough for those college coaches to translate to the league when those coaches are used to stepping onto the field and basically out talenting every opponent. Like you can't even sniff the Oregon Ducks if you're you know San Jose State or whatever. They get trucked right. And so then you come to the NFL where parody is the name of the game. And yeah, there's the basement dwellers and then there's the playoff uh, caliber teams and whatnot. But in all reality, the gap between those from a talent perspective is not ever all that far off. Jeff C jumping in to say, appreciate you, Jeff. You've been with us a long time, my dog, long time from the beginning. So love you. He said, time to have a convo about Vaughn. His production is lackluster and it's showing. Let's get value while we can. A rookie had more impact at Cleveland. Well, here's the thing on that hashtag rebuild. He he uh, concludes. Um, Vaughn, first of all, is the only guy producing at the point of attack relative to getting after the quarterback. Literally the only dude on the team. So do you want to completely hamstring? I mean, take your team out at the kneecaps, any ability to pressure the quarterback. I get it, Cooper. He did look good, and I'm with you on that. Like, he needs to see more playing time. But we don't know at this stage whether that was a flash in the pan. You know, Browns were playing what, Zach? Both backup tackles, if I'm not mistaken. Like, there's a lot of reasons for misgivings. Not so much misgivings on Cooper, but like, hey, cool to see. Glad you did it. Do it again, right? Believe it when we see it. Kind of be doubting Thomas's. On the Vaughn question... I don't think that so long as you want to compete in this season, that's even a a topic you countenance. And let's say the season's over. You still have to tread carefully because Vaughn is a future Hall of Fame player. And I think he's shown, even though he's kind of dipped the last three weeks, he's kind of shown, Zach, that he's not finished yet. This is not a guy that's completely burned out talent-wise. Like, the talent's still there, that twitch, the speed – He's just not getting uh, the support around him that allows Vaughn, because that's the one thing people miss on the whole Vaughn issue. He has always had a fellow premier pass rusher opposite him. All of his productive years, I mean, go back to the first couple. It was Elvis Doomerville. Then comes uh, uh, DeMarcus Ware. Then you get Bradley Chubb, right? And so he's always had that guy to help take some of the pressure, which allows him not always, and pro- in fact, probably not even you know half the time, but it allows him more windows where he's on an island one-on-one with a tackle, and he can win. He can win those matchups. So I don't know. I, I don't want – in other words, get Chubb back here ASAP. You know, Hopefully he gets well sooner than later or put Cooper on the field, somebody that can put a little pressure one-on-one on the quarterback because Malik Reed, that's just not his bag. Yeah, and then there's Shane Ray, womp womp. You know, it's these great pass rushers and then just Shane Ray. 
Uh, the couple points I want to add. I, I agree with what the premise of you're saying. Him being a future Hall of Famer, first ballot, franchise icon. I don't think George Payton is going to be the one to trade that away for, what, a, a second or third round draft pick? You're not going to get a Khalil Mack level haul. And also, why would a team give up that second round pick when you re- realize that Vaughn's going to be a free agent after the season? A team can just sign him, not have to give up a draft pick. So I don't think he's going anywhere. I think they're going to keep the band mostly together until they maybe all break apart after the year. Jeremy, a.k.a. Black Knight, says Aaron Rodgers paired with Kellen Moore. Awesome. Yeah, I think it would be awesome. But I don't I don't think that would work. Here's the thing, though, whether you think it would or not, it's Aaron Rodgers and an up and coming hot young coach. All right. On the surface. But this is. Yeah, I get it. It's Aaron Rodgers, but you're going back to the old hat philosophy that has not served this team since Peyton hung up his cleats. So start over, do it the hard way, build with a guy you drafted with a coach that believes in him from the drop and let the chips fall. I mean, you kind of need one or the other. You don't necessarily need both Rodgers and a, a level of talent of a coach like Kellen Moore. I don't think they would be paired necessarily well together. Rodgers would feel shown up by the genius and brilliance of Kellen Moore and uh, just wouldn't be a good working relationship there. But I agree with the premise of what they're saying. It's just get a more exciting option under center, get a more exciting head coach or offensive coordinator and, and let the, the results speak for themselves. All right, we got one from Mike Reno, and then I'm going to grab one from Dale Rude, one of our great longtime Super Chat superstars. Uh, Mike says, do you think if Teddy stinks it up against Washington, he gets benched? I don't think the Broncos can withstand it beyond this this week. If he, if he sucks and they lose, I, I don't think they can go another week without making a quarterback change. I really don't. Whether Vic's the head coach or not, like Zach, tuning in, anyone tuning in to these press conferences, I mean – you can tell Vic is shook. You can tell the pressure. I mean, it's crushing him right now. And I just don't think you can stand up there with a straight face. And like he said today, do you still believe in Teddy? I do. I do. It's like, come on, dude, you've lost four in a row. Give me a freaking break. I don't think he can withstand it. Now I've been wrong before. And I've even said, you're probably not going to see a coaching change. Zach till Vic is uh, dismissed or pardon me, a quarterback change till Vic is dismissed. Just reading the tea leaves this week has kind of altered my perspective on that. I think you could see a quarterback change if they do indeed lose to Washington. I think if they lose to Washington, you're going to see the scapegoats starting with Vic Fangio. I think Pat Shermer goes. It'll be three and five. The season's definitely on the brink. You know, they're on life support in terms of being at that record. Five straight losses, Chad, after starting three and zero. So if Pat Shermer goes, let's say Mike Shula gets promoted, I think hand in hand, that's the perfect time to make a quarterback switch, and that's where Drew Locke would come in. So it's definitely possible. All right, Dale, what's going on, my friend? The uh, man single-handedly responsible for my kids' inability to do their homework because he provided a PS5. I paid for that PS5, but Dale was man Johnny on the spot. Heard me talking about it around Christmas time. DM me. He's like, hey, dude, I got my eyes on two. I'm getting one. You want me to buy them both and you buy the other one for me? I'm like, dude, thank you. So always going to have a special place in my heart, Dale. He says, Peyton gave the coaches what they asked for with the ar- agreement uh, being make the playoffs. He's a man of his word and isn't going to go against the coaching staff until we're out of the playoffs. What are your thoughts, Zach? Oh, I mean, if they go three and five, they lose to Washington, a team that they sh- really should beat at home, you know, coming off a 10 day break. I don't know how Peyton doesn't step in and at least put pressure on Fangio to fire someone. Pick one, Tom McMahon, Pat Shermer, make a change, bench Teddy Bridgewater, bench a player. I mean, let's get something going here. And I think it's going to take care of itself. I don't think he's going to fire Vic Fangio if they lose this game, but I do think Fangio would fire Pat Shermer. And then at that point, you would keep scapegoating until you do get to Vic Fangio. But the premise of what Dale is saying is correct, too. Peyton has shown he wants to play the long game, Chad. He wants to be patient and he's have a lot to of lose, honestly. He's honeymoon. secure. Yeah. So I think after the season is when you're going to see the bulk of the coaching moves. Um, all right. Let me see here. We got one from Naj. Um, that I'm just going to read because the chat jumped him. So let me let me read this here. Naj, love you, bro. He says, uh, I'm seeing a lot of negativity towards Teddy. I get it, but he's on pace for 30 touchdowns and 12 picks. Before the season, I think we all thought 
that out of the QB equals thought that out out of the QB equals playoffs. I put all this on the coaches, and the buck stops with the head coach. Um, all right, let's let's go ahead and uh, I know what you mean by the he's on pace for. Okay, it's easy to do that. Like take his total stats divided by the games played, and then multiply that by seventeen. Right. Well, let me tell you what his stats have been uh, the last uh, four games, all right, in the losing streak, because he started the season hot, right? Four touchdowns, zero picks. Well, he's continued throwing touchdowns amid the losing streak, Zach. He's thrown three, six, eight over these four games. But then oh. he's just in the last two games, he was responsible for five giveaways. And then he also had an interception in Pittsburgh. So that's six giveaways in the last three games. It's not sustainable, you know? So if you were to say, Hey, you know, uh, he's on, take those last three games and then divide that and multiply it by what the balance that gives you a better bead on the trajectory. Teddy season is actually heading toward. Well, as always context matters. Some of these touchdowns come in garbage time, which kind of skew the, the projections there. If a quarterback throws 20 touchdowns, but the Broncos win 10 games, I'll take that rather than the, him throwing 30 touchdowns and the Broncos win seven games. It's all in the context, and uh, if you watch the games, you see it's not all on the coaching. It's not a hundred single percent on the coaching. It's mostly on the coaching. I would say ninety percent, but that other ten percent, Teddy Bridgewater's in there as well. His play has not been good enough since the three and zero start. Point blank. Uh, let's try and get to. We only have a few minutes left, Scott. Let's throw up as many of our Facebook supporter stars comments as we possibly can because Facebook is going off the chain. All right, Andrew Lampy with another huge night. Matthew right behind him. Josh Hoyle, Michael Ronquillo, Howie Frickin' Day, Shane Daniels, Mike Reno, Doug Raquel, Lawrence Rivera. I mean, these are these are the names we've all uh, come to know and love. Uh, Travis Tarbox, uh, Andrew Baker, Claude Riley, Johnny Martin, a newer name. Welcome, appreciate you. And Ed Keating, love you guys. Thanks for everything. We'll do um, before we get out of here. Remind me too. We'll see where how much of that thirteen percent gap we we may have closed as well. Lawrence, you the man, bro. He says, not gonna lie. The one good thing out of this is loving the cheaper ticket opportunity, <laughs> more family friendly than it was when Manning was around. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for silver linings, that's that's a solid one. Sad. <laughs> uh here's one uh did we get this no shane says we did get this scott okay anticipation teddy holding on to the ball too long etc etc third highest rate in the nfl uh bear with me one sec guys here's uh okay we did get doug there did we get this one all right on the topic of the next quarterback right the draft how he says i don't know about y'all but I'd rather take the guys with better decisions uh, and is a good passer first and foremost. Big body, durable, being a pocket passer, that can get the ball out soon. Good if he is even a little bit athletic. What do you all think? Yeah, I'm not one of these that's 100% like, you know, needs to be Lamar Jackson to even be considered or Patrick Mahomes for that matter. But I think you need to find somebody that can kind of live in both worlds a little bit, not so much be master of none, but still, you know, probably prioritize the pocket first. I'm with you on that. Quarterbacks that, Zach, that cannot. There's one thing to see a guy with a big arm throw a pretty pass. Make it, Oh, he can make all the throws, man. NFL caliber arm. Cool. How does he perform in the pocket when four, five, 250 to 300 pound dudes are screaming around the edge and right up his, in his face trying to take his head off? How does he, can he process, can he execute, can he perform under pressure? And it's not just pressure, guys. It's like under direct threat of physical harm. Can you execute? And that's the that's the component. So if you can operate within those strictures well as a pocket passer, I don't care. Peyton Manning, look, dude, he wasn't always the guy that when the sack would come, he'd just fall down. You know, that's what basically he was he had to resort uh, resort to post four neck surgeries. But even then, you know what? That guy did not get rattled. He only went down like that when he knew his goose was cooked. He's like, all right, live to fight another down. I'm just going to drop. But that dude would stay in the pocket. 
He would step up. He would navigate. He'd deliver. Same with Tom Brady, right? They were elusive in that sense because they used that pocket as a shield, as a, you know, as a protector and instead of panicking when the chips were down. And so that is important, I think. Yeah, I'm with you. It doesn't have to be a Lamar Jackson, but the other end of the spectrum, I don't want a Joe Flacco statue. So somewhere right in the middle would be preferable. And, you you know, look at some of the top draft picks in recent years, Joe Burrow and Trevor Lawrence. They're not scrambling quarterbacks. They're mostly pocket passers. So I think, you know, you you have to have a quarterback with maneuverability and a good feel for the pocket. Listen, Tom Brady was never, ever, ever, ever regarded as a running quarterback. The opposite, actually. But he has, I think, the best pocket feel and pocket presence of any quarterback to ever play the game. If you're blessed with that heady ability, it can overcome natural uh, deficiencies uh, with your legs on the ground. And I think Drew Locke, one of his stronger assets, Chad, was using his legs to get out of trouble. He, he wasn't a statue. He can run a little bit, but his way of maneuvering in the pocket and beating pressure and avoiding sacks, I think that was one of his bigger attributes. He would panic too soon. Like a lot of the problems he created for himself last year, like yep. blowing out of the pocket too soon. And um, But guys, we'll talk more about all this, this stuff tomorrow night. We got to go for now, but real quick, check this out. And yes, Shane, if we, if we lose to Washington, burn it all down and rebuild. Fire and brimstone. We're right there with you, my dog. Mike says, watch Drew get picked up by Washington and seriously compete for the division lead next year. Wouldn't surprise me. It really wouldn't. I I still have some belief in Drew. I just don't know that he's going to ever really get another sincere shot to be the guy anywhere. But time will tell. But look at this, Zach. Talk about bridging a gap. We went from 87% at the start of the show to 96% complete to the goal of 250,000 stars. We will. This tells me. We are for sure raffling off a pass or tan jersey. So hats off to all of you. Love you. Thank you so much for everything. With that, Zach, sign us off. Go through the rundown, my dog. Yes, sir. Appreciate you guys tuning in with us tonight. We're back tomorrow night, 6 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Eastern. But until that time, be sure to follow the pod on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main account on Twitter for all your Broncos news, analysis, rumors, film breakdowns and so much more at Mile High Huddle. You can follow Chad on Twitter at Chad and Jensen. You can follow myself at Kelberman NFL. Go to huddleuppod.com right now and get your swag on. Get yourself a football priest hat, football priest shirt, coaching, coaching, coaching shirt, anything you fancy is in that store at huddleuppod.com. Also, facebook.com slash milehighhuddle. Hit that big blue button. Three VIP shows at your fingertips. Kelberman's Corner, Broncos Book Club, and Trickle Zone. Also, facebook.com slash milehighhuddlepod. Like that page. And if you haven't already, go to Apple Podcasts and leave your football priest a five-star review for a chance to win some swag each and every month. We want to give it away. We're dying to give it away. So do that right away. Also, and if you can't do any of those things, subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel. Helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like you. Love you guys. We'll see you tomorrow for the Mile High Mailbag. We'll take a harder look at Washington football team. Take care, guys. And as always, go Broncos. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.